In this video, we'll talk about risk aversion, what is it, and how we can manage it. Risk aversion is simply put, the dislike of uncertainty. And as decision makers, there are two main ways that we can mitigate uncertainty. One of them is insurance and diversification. So for the remainder of this video, we're going to use a model of utility to explain what risk aversion is, and then we'll talk about ways to mitigate uncertainty. To understand risk aversion, let's use a model. The model is going to be the one of a utility function. Utility is a subjective measure of well-being that depends on individuals' choices. But because choices are many, let's keep it simple and let's just say that this well-being is going to depend on wealth. So the utility function is simply a mapping between wealth and utility. So if you want to know how much subjective well-being you have, look at your current level of wealth and then map that out to this utility function. And that is going to tell you your current level of subjective utility. So there is one important feature of this utility function that is worth mentioning, and that is diminishing marginal utility. What does that mean? Well, let's suppose that your utility level is currently right there. And let's say that we increase wealth by this monetary amount. That is going to be associated with an increase of utility of U1 units. If we, on the other hand, have a wealth level that is much higher than the previous one, and we increase that wealth by exactly the same monetary amount, the increase in subjective utility is going to be smaller. So what this implies, what diminishing marginal utility implies, is that the value of $1 decreases as someone has more and more wealth. So that one value to somebody who is relatively poor is much lower, well, I'm sorry, much higher than the value of $1 to somebody who is relatively wealthy. So let's use a utility function to understand risk aversion. And let's suppose, for the sake of this example, that I offer you a gamble. We toss a fair coin, and if it's heads, I give you $1,000, and if it's tails, you give me $1,000. For the sake of the example, let's suppose that your current level of wealth is W and your current level of utility is U. If that's the case, winning the $1,000 would put you at levels of wealth, let's say WH, and utility levels UH. Losing the gamble would put you at a utility level of WL and a utility level of UL. If that was the case, then you can clearly see that the utility gain from winning a thousand, that is that vertical distance right there, is much, much smaller than the loss in utility of losing that bet. And that is essentially risk aversion. We don't like risk because these bets imply that losses hurt more than winning or victories. Now that we've established that individuals don't like risk, let's think about how to manage it. One way is insurance. How does insurance work? Well, a person facing a risk pays a fee to an insurance company, which in return contracts to accept part or all of the risk. Insurance companies, on the other hand, gather premiums that are, in fact, more than what they need to cover the claims on their risky contracts and make a profit by doing so. So why does this work? Well, think about it. It is easier for a large group of people, say 10,000 people, to each bear one ten thousandth of the risk of a house burning down 
than for one person to bear the entire risk alone. As we mentioned, the utility losses of having your house burned down is so large that each of us would be more than willing to pay a nominal amount to uh, not bear that burden alone. So there is a term that will be used in many instances that I would like you to be familiar with, and that is actuarially fair insurance. In the context of insurance companies, actuarially fair means that the insurance premium they are charging you is commensurate with the risk that they are taking in for you. So in most cases, what you want to have is at some actuarially fair insurance premiums charged for a company to take the risk you want them to. Now that we know that we need insurance, let's think about two important problems in insurance markets. One, adverse selection, and two, moral hazard. Adverse selection simply says that a high-risk person benefits more from insurance, so therefore they are more likely to purchase it. Moral hazard, on the other hand, says that people with insurance have less incentives to avoid risky behavior. Now, these two problems are rooted in asymmetric information. And that happens when parties about to engage in the contract know very different levels of information about the underlying risk in the contract. So let's think about adverse selection from the perspective of health insurance. Sick people are much more likely to buy health insurance than healthy people. And because they benefit more from insurance, they're more likely to buy it. Now here's the problem. If only sick people buy insurance, then risk premiums will be high. But if risk premiums are high, or I'm sorry, insurance premiums are high, then all the healthy people who are likely to face less risk are unwilling to purchase insurance. So only the sickliest of people uh, remain in the insurance pool. Well, if only sick people remain in the insurance pool, then premiums are likely to increase. And if premiums increase, all the relatively healthy people from the pool leave, leaving only the sickest individuals. If this spiral continues, Insurance is likely to disappear from the health market because only the sick people will remain while the healthy people will not want to buy health insurance. And that is called the insurance death spiral. And it happens because of adverse selection. Now, on the other hand, moral hazard happens when there is hidden actions. And let's say that you recently purchased some auto insurance and that insurance covered you against accidents. Now, because after buying the insurance contract, you are facing much less financial risk of an accident, you start driving more recklessly. Now, because the insurance company does not know about your driving habits, um, then you are hiding an action from them and increasing the cost of the insurance for everybody. So let's practice uh, these two concepts of adverse selection and moral hazard. For the following three scenarios, I would like you to identify whether each of the following is an example of either adverse selection or moral hazard. Please answer the questions on top hat. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time of answering those questions. So here are the solutions. Now for A, Joe begins smoking in bed after buying fire insurance. That is clearly a hidden action. And Joe is uh, an example of the problem of moral hazard. Now for B, both of Susan's parents lost their teeth to gum disease. Well, if that's the case, Susan is likely um, to have a genetic predisposition to gum disease. So Susan knows more than the insurance uh, company about her risk of gum disease, so therefore, she buys dental insurance because she benefits the most from it. This would be an example of adverse selection. C. When Gertrude parks her Corvette convertible, she does not bother putting the top up because her insurance covers theft of any items left in the car. Again, she is taking an action that adversely affects the insurance company. 
and she's hiding this from the insurance company and it is moral hazard. Another way that we can manage risk is through diversification. Now diversification is a reducing risk by replacing a single risk with a large number of smaller unrelated uh, risks. It is in essence not putting your eggs all in one basket. In the financial sense, let's say that you have um, purchased some assets and those assets have some underlying risk. Now, what you want to do in a diversified portfolio is to choose assets whose returns are not correlated to each other. So some of these assets may do very well and some others do very badly. And as long as those highs and lows are not going in the same direction, but rather offsetting each other, the high and low returns will average out. So the portfolio is likely to earn an intermediate return more consistently than any of the assets contained in the portfolio. Going deeper into uh, financial products, let's think about stock diversification. And let me define two kinds of risk in this market. Number one is firm specific risk. Number two is market risk. For firm specific risk, it only affects a single company. This may be something like bad investments or really good investment in a particular firm, whereas market risk is the kind of risk that will affect all companies in the stock market. Now, diversification or putting the eggs in different baskets can eliminate firm specific risk, but cannot fully eliminate market risk. To see this, take a look at this graph. And here we have the portfolio return risk on the y-axis and the number of stocks in your portfolio on the x-axis. As you increase the number of stocks in your portfolio, you reduce the risk that any one single um, stock is going to really affect the returns on your portfolio. But as you increase the amount of stocks in your portfolio, you can never eliminate market risk because the market as a whole will likely go up and down together and you can't get rid of that risk unless you're willing to then spread your investments across multiple kinds of financial instruments.